Let's discuss Cyber Essentials. Cyber Essentials, if you didn't already know, is a UK government backed scheme that helps to promote cyber hygiene or cyber awareness or protecting your business through cyber based attacks or protecting against cyber based attacks. And if you implement Cyber Essentials, it's known to protect your business against up to about 80% worth of cyber based attacks. Now, there's a lot of words of attacks in this uh, thing, which is just crazy, but there we go. So, Cyber Essentials is a government back scheme, as I've mentioned. It is mandatory for any consultation for government, MOD, or potentially NHS and any supply chain frameworks that are going through at the moment. And a lot more companies are actually applying Cyber Essentials that I've noticed. This year, or the last six months of recording this, it's gone through the roof. It's, it's insane. If you didn't know what Cyber Essentials is, there's two versions of Cyber Essentials. There's the basic Cyber Essentials, which is a self-assessed version that you go into an online portal and you go in fill in about 40 odd questions or so. This is the one that we're going to go through today. And then there's the Cyber Essentials Plus version, which is the audited version. Now the Plus version needs to have this Cyber Essentials Basic version completed. And then you have up to three months to get the Plus version done. Uh, we'll make a video on the Plus one later on at some stage if people are interested. But for the basic one, there's five core controls that uh, you have to work through, which is firewalls or gateway border controls, secure access configuration, user access control, malware protection and patch management. And now, once you've got all these five uh, controls in place, that will should potentially um, protect your business by quite a bit. Now the basic cyber essentials is uh, made up of eight sections that we're going to go through and each section just tailors um, a couple of little sections of each bit. Um, the first bit is all discussing all about your company and, and things like that so we'll, we'll pretty much gloss over that fairly quick and then the other ones we'll get into a bit more detail with. So here we go. So the first section that we've got is all about your company and as you can see here there's a couple of questions are all about you know what your company name is is it registered where's your organizational address you know what's your type of business now here put as much information in as possible i can't stress enough that although a lot of the questions on this self-assessment are pretty much just yes 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 or do you do this answer yes and there's a couple of questions that say describe this to make the assessor's information uh, well the assessor's job easier I guess is the right way of saying it is try and put as much information in as possible you don't have to write one piece but you know write a sentence or two for each question if you can if it makes sense do it it just makes life a little bit easier and the, the certification body or the assessor like myself you get a more of an understanding of what the business is and it just helps the market okay so as you can see here we've got what's your organizational name obviously what's your name what's the registered name if um if you're a limited company partnership, sole trade, or anything like that, to put it in. The next one is, what's your organizational registration number? If you're registered against company's house, or if you're doing this from America or some international way, where are you registered? Do you have a number against that? If you don't, just stick an A in or, and stick a little bit of a description in or something like that. The organizational address, what is your address? It, this has to be a registered one. This helps um, for any insurance purposes that you need later on. Another thing we could say here is with the Cyber Essentials self-assessment, you do get up to £25,000 cyber liability insurance free of charge with this certification if you want it. You know, you don't have to have it, but you can go in and get it if you like. The next question is, uh, what's your website address? If you've got a website, stick it in there. If you don't have one, doesn't matter, just stick in. I don't have a website. And then, what's the size of your business? This is the one where you're going to have a, a section of 1 to x, x to x, x to x. Find the, uh, the group of sizing that fits your business and put that in there. And then the next one is how many uh, home workers do you have? Now, as we've got COVID and a lot of people are working from home, if you have more than, if you work from home more than 50% of the time, you have to have, you class them as a home worker. So if all your staff at the moment are working from home due to COVID, then you'd have to put down 100% all home workers. If you've only got 50% of people working 51% of the time at home, they're still classed as a home worker, so you have to put them down as a home worker. The next section is all about scoping of the assessment. So this one's just trying to get a bit more information about 
your business and the scoping for the cyber essentials. So the first question is, do you, does the scope of your assessment cover the whole organization? Um, normally this will just be a yes. If it's not going to cover the whole um, organization, for example, if you're a big PLC company or if you're a big company or a group of companies and you have multiple companies or sub-entities going around and you only want to do one little small sub-entity, then you can put that under Cyber Essentials. So you could say, no, it's not going to cover my whole organization. But the next question where it says, if it's not your whole organization, then what is the scope? You'd put that in there. So you might say, no, it's not my whole organization, but it's going to cover um, Billy Bob's development company, something like that. Okay. Now, next question is, uh, please describe your geographical locations. So this is one where it's, it's pretty much you're just describing what is in scope or what offices are in scope. So you could say all U UK offices, or you could say main head office is in scope, or head office plus home offices if everyone's working from home. And now the next one, which is I get a lot of feedback on, or I provide a lot of feedback for people, is please list the quantities of computers, tablets, and servers in scope. Now, if you manage a computer or a device and you patch it, you log onto it, you remote desktop onto it, that is in scope. Even if it's cloud-based, so if you're using Azure AWS, but you go onto those machines, you patch them, you manage them, they're in scope as well. Okay? Now, with this, you've got to list them all. So you could say, like, we have 10 times Windows 10 professional build whatever version. Okay, that's the important bit. You've got For Windows 10, you've got to put the version number in. Well, for every operating system, you've got to put the version number in. But for Windows 10, put the version number in, okay? So you could say we have 10 Windows 10 2004, we have 3 Windows Server 2019, we have 2 Ubuntu Linux 1804 LTS. That's another thing to say if you've got a Windows, if you've got a Linux machine, please state if it's a long term support or not. It just makes life easier, otherwise, we have to go back to you and say, is this long term support or not if it's an older version. Now the next one, A27, please list quantities in of the mobile devices. This is, if you have any mobile devices, mobile phones, tablets, anything like that, that accesses business information, so if it accesses email, if you access Word documents, files, Adobe, anything like that on these mobile devices, they're in scope as well. Now again, even if the home, um, if the home phones, so they're not actually owned by the business, but the home, and they are actually connect to your email, they're still in scope as well, okay? So ideally, you should put some kind of MDM or mobile device management in place so you can manage the, the work profile of things on those devices. Now, with the mobile device management for iOS, you have to run the latest version of iOS for Cyber Essentials. At the moment, it's 14.1. So if 14.2 um, or 14.3 came out a couple of weeks later, you'd have to upgrade all those iOS phones up to the latest version. At the moment for Android, it is 8.01, I believe, at the moment. So with Android, it's a lot easier to do that. Now, the next question is, please list a list of all the networks that are in scope. So with that, you could just say it is the head office operational network that's in scope and home offices or home networks are in scope as well. If you have multiple networks and they're all in scope, so if you've got... Um, I don't know, operational network, you've got a head office network, you've got QA, you've got dev, and they're all split up and they're all in the scope with this assessment, you'd have to list all them in. You don't have to put any IP addresses in or any subnet information, anything like that. It's just purely descriptional. So the next one is, please list, um, list all your network equipment. This is listing the border or the edge control uh, hardware. So what firewalls, what routers do you have in place? You don't have to list switches, you don't have to list access points, but list what switches and routers, uh, what routers and firewalls you've got in place. So for example, I have a Cisco ASA, something like that, with model number, or I have a Netgear, something like that. Now, if you're working from home, you've got a lot of home workers, you also have to put their home routers in place as well. So if you've got an ISP router, like a BT Home Hub or a Virgin Media Super Hub 3, something like that, you'd also have to list those as well. So there might be a little bit of work with the home users, which could be interesting. And then the next question is, please provide the name and the role of the person who's responsible for managing this information. So this is just listing the person who mainly controls all the information security within the business. So you need to have a named point of contact. And just remember to put the name and the role in there. The amount of people who forget to put the role in this question, in, yeah, in the answer to this question, is amazing. 
Okay, the next section is all about insurance. This option, uh, which I mentioned before, is where you get the cyber bill insurance for free, up to £25,000 uh, if you don't turn over more than £20 million. So, you don't have to fill this section in if you don't want it. If you've already got cyber bill insurance, that's fine. You can just ignore it. You can just say, no, I do not want this insurance and just move on. If you do want it, it's free. It's not going to cost you anything and, you know, it's, it's a nice to have. So, we'll just quickly skip over that. But as you can see on the answers here, you can just go through, yeah, just answer the questions. Rough, yeah, gross, gross turnover to the nearest thousand, hundred thousand. Is your company based in the UK? Is it based in the US? And things like that. Now, the next section is all about office firewalls in internet gateways. So, this one's just asking you, making sure, do you have firewalls at the gateway, at the, at the border of the, the boundary of your network? So, for example, you've got your office or you've got your home, and then you've got the internet. You have to make sure that you've got a firewall and a router, a firewall and a router in place there to segregate the internet coming in and going out from your device. Okay. So, for example, if you are at home, you've got your BT Home Hub or your Super Hub there from Virgin Media. That is your your border there, and that is your router. And you've got your firewall built into there, so you'd have to list that. So you got that, and you go yes. The amount of people say no, we don't have one. Well, yeah, you pretty much do. You know, everyone these days on uh, the internet have got a some kind of border control in place. Now the next question is, when you first receive your, your router, do you change the default password? Now this is an important one, this is the one where a lot of people say no to, but for Cyber Essentials you have to go in, you have to make sure that every single router, is uh, router password is changed. This is best practice, you know, a lot of devices have, you know, the a default password printed onto the box and they're all the same for everyone, so if anyone knows the make and model of the device that could potentially get on, log in and compromise your systems. Yes, it's, it's a bit of a reach, yes, but it's cyber best practice. So you have to make sure that happens. And again, if you've got home users, you have to make sure every home user has done that with their ISP router as well. So the next one is, is all the new passwords at least the minimum of eight characters or longer? Again, this is cyber best hygiene. You know, make sure you've got your passwords at least eight characters or more. You know, more the merrier, you know, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, special characters. If you use password managers, you know, create a password in the password manager where it's nice and strong and save it in there. And then the next one is, do you change your password when you believe it's been compromised? The obvious question here is yes, or you should do anyway. Yeah, if you've uh, realized that your password or your details have been compromised, you should change everything that you've known that's been compromised straight away. Okay, so even if you don't, no, it's been compromised, that's fine. Until until you actually know that it has been compromised, then you've got to say, yes, it's been compromised, change it, move on, update all the information, inform your staff, inform everyone, and go from there. Now, the next question is, do you have any services enabled that are accessible externally from the internet routers or the hardware firewalls, and that doesn't have a documented business case? So that's the main bit there, that does not have a documented business case. The amount of people here who say, Yes, we do have services enabled, but we don't have a documented business case. Nine times out of ten, if you've got a service open on the internet through your router, you can have a documented business case. It might be the case that you're allowing SMTP through, you know, email, um, you might have web servers and things like that. If you're opening them up, you're probably going to have a documented business case for saying, you know, we need to open port 25 for email and vice versa, things like that. So just have a look at that, make sure that's all done. The next question is, do you have any services enabled in firewall that uh, do have a process to ensure that they're, and do you have a process to ensure that they are disabled in a timely manner if they're no longer required? So this is one's all about change control. Do you have any services open on the internet through your router? If you do, great, or it could be great. If you no longer use those services, do you have a process in place to shut down the ports, turn the disa uh, disable the service, turn the service off and go from there? And is it all documented? If you haven't, you should. Next one is, have you configured internet routers of hardware firewalls so that they block all other services from being advertised on the internet? This one is pretty much just saying, have you pretty much slammed the door down on the firewall? Have you blocked everything that you don't need? Most firewalls these days have an implicit deny all, so they just block everything and then you have to open stuff. Uh, this is what this one's asking you. Pretty much saying, do not allow anything in unless you have to. If you have to allow anything in, you've got to have a documented business case for it. Okay, and then the next one is, um, 
Are you an internet browser? How do your firewalls configured to allow access to the configuration settings of the internet? So if you're using um, routers or firewalls such as Meraki, which have a cloud-based portal, then that would be a yes. You have to access them over the internet, so the settings are over there. However, you lock them down. You know, you, you've you got to log into this portal. You normally have 2FA on, and you can also enable trusted IP access to it. So that's what this is one's asking for. It's just making sure that you're not exposing your IP or your configuration details of your firewall and router across the internet without being fully locked down and managed. And then the next one is, do you have any um, two-factor authentication enabled for it if you've said yes? And then do you have software firewalls enabled on all your computers and laptops? Best practice is, yes, you should have firewalls enabled on all devices that are connected to your network. You know, Max, yes, you need firewalls on Windows. Yes, you need firewalls on Linux. Yes, you need firewalls on uh, servers. Yes, you need firewalls on. Okay, and I've noticed that question's on there twice. So secure configuration, what you're able to do so have you removed or disabled all your software that you do not use on your laptops. This one's just saying, if you've got any software on your computer that's no longer needed, that's no longer supported, that's no longer managed, have you removed it? It's changed control, it's keeping your devices nice and clean, it's re reducing that foothold, potential foothold that someone could get on. You know, if there's a software on there that's not no longer getting supported, it's out of date, there could be security vulnerabilities, there could be weaknesses in there, and if anyone gets in your network, in your environment, they could potentially access some kind of vulnerability that you don't know that's on that machine. So removing those features that are no longer needed reduces that scope. Okay. And have you ensured that all your laptops, computer servers, tablets, and mobile devices only contain the user accounts that are needed? This one is just making sure that you only have the user accounts on your devices that you absolutely need. Yes, you need your user account to log into the machine. You might have a, an administrator one that's on there. Uh, you should have guest disabled and any old user accounts disabled on there as well. So it's only allowing the user access for the people that actually need access to that machine. And next one is, have you changed the default password for the user and administrative accounts on all your computers uh, to a non-guessable password of eight characters? Again, this is cyber best practice. You know, make sure that your strong administrative passwords, your super users, your roots and everything like that is using a strong password. You know, if, you, if you've got an admin account that is not using eight characters or more, then you really should be. You know, it should be uppercase, lowercase, special characters, numbers, Primary, really generated through a um, password manager and gone from there. It should be really hard that you don't actually know it and you've got to copy and paste it through your password manager. And then again, uh, do you, all your user administrators use passwords of at least eight characters? Pretty much what we've just said. You know, the so best practice is use eight characters or more for all user passwords. And then next one is, do you use software that provides sensitive or critical information that shouldn't be uh, made public? To uh, across the internet. So if you are, I guess, providing software or access to information and it's across the internet, is it protected? You know, if it's uh, confidential, if it's secretive, if it's um, PII information, stuff like that, you should ensure that that is properly protected, locked away and not exposed across the internet. So if you do do that, um, you have to pretty much make sure that all the services use a password or their characters or more and uh, doesn't restrict the length. So that is saying that if you do provide secretive information, uh, PII, anything like that, and it's in a web portal that you've got to log into, you've got to make sure there's an authentication to get into there. So for example, if you have information on Dropbox or something like that, and you've got a link to it, you're still going to make sure that you have to log in to go to that uh, link. And then if yes you do do that, if, it, uh, if your password has been compromised or anything like that, do you change it? Again, yes you should. And then are all your systems set to lock out after 10 or few unsuccessful uh, login attempts or limit the number of login attempts? This is just asking about brute force protection. It's saying if someone's trying to brute force your login or log into your system so many times, it's got it wrong so many times, you need a me mechanism in place to actually just say look, stop it. We're cutting you off, that's it. And this is the one where it says 10 or more. And then the next one says, yes, if you do do that, do you have a policy that's pushed to all users? So that this should be part of your information security 
policy or your management framework or anything like that. Just create a policy that's in. We have an account lockout policy which is 10 or less and it pushes out all people. Then the next one is, is order run or order play disabled on all your systems. This is if protecting you against, I guess it's more than all the versions. So if you're logging in, plugging a USB device in or a CD, something like that, and it auto runs and executes, you could potentially be executing malware. So this is just saying, make sure you've got a login prompt or it's just completely disabled and go from there. Okay, the next one are all your operating systems and firmware on your devices supported by a supplier and patched. This is just making sure that all systems, including firmware, surprisingly, a lot of people don't actually look for firmware, but you've got to make sure that all operating systems, firmware on all devices are patched and up to date all the time. If you get notified of a security update that comes out within 14 days, you have to make sure that you actually get that installed within the 14 day window. And it's the same for um, third party applications as well. So for example, um, Office, Adobe, things like that. So all high risk critical security applications and operating systems installed within the 14 days. This is what we were just saying pretty much. If you get an update that comes out as a security uh, update, you can make sure it's pushed out within 14 days of release. And same again with applications. And then um, A66, have you removed any applications and devices that are no longer supported? We've pretty much gone over this before. If you've got an application that's no longer supported, no longer used, just remove it. It gets rid of that footprint, it cleans your machine up and it goes from there. So user accounts um, are only the user accounts provided uh, after a process has been followed. So this is your onboarding process. So do you have a process to onboard users? Um, normally this is from HR and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and just fill it in, put all the information that you've got. Okay. And can only access uh, computers and servers using a unique username and password. Normally, yes. You know, you log in and go, for, yeah. And then, how do you ensure that uh, you have deleted or disabled any accounts that no longer work? So, this is your offboarding process. You just got to make sure that anyone who's been who's left the company or been fired or sacked or anything like that, you've got a proper onboarding process so you can just go through, delete the accounts, disable access and go from there. So the next question is how do you ensure that the staff only have access or the privileges that need to do their current job? This is all about role based access. Um, do you have a process within the business to say user X only has access to A, B and C or user B has access to D, E, F and things like that. And then do you have a formal process for giving anyone access to systems like an administrator? So again, do you have a formal process to say, this person needs administrative access to all of this? Do you have a process? Yes, you do. Hopefully you do anyway. Okay, and then a bit more on user accounts. So how do you ensure that staff only use administrative accounts to carry out administrative activities? This is saying, making sure that user accounts are not by administrative access by default. So you cannot use your user accounts day in, day out as administrator. You've got to use a low privileged account. And then how do you ensure that your administrative accounts aren't used for accessing email or web? Again, you know, don't use your administrative account for day in, day out activities. You know, only use your administrative account to install software, configure settings and things like that, then log out. So if you have to privilege up, fair enough, and then privilege back down. And then do you formally track the users who have administrative access? So this is all about change control and access. Just making sure you know who has your access to your administrative accounts. And then do you review the administrative accounts? Ideally you should. If you're tracking them, you should be reviewing them. It could be once a quarter, it could be yearly, it could be anything like that. And then do you have two-factor authentication for administrative accounts? Ideally yes, any administrative accounts that have access to well, critical systems should have two-factor authentication if enabled and supported. And then if you don't have it, why not? And then, last uh, question's all about malware. Yeah. Yay! So all of your computers, laptops, tablets, mobile phones protected from malware by either having any malware installed, limiting uh, installation of applications, or application sandboxing. So this is just saying, do all your devices have some kind of control in place to restrict malware? And then it just goes through saying, option A, if you have it, is it installed, is it set to update, and things like that. And then it's a set to scan web pages. Um, if it's option B, do you have um, options if it's just App Store or application signing? And that is it. So I hope this helps. Um, yeah, I hope that uh, if you're going through Cyber Essentials, I hope this makes it a lot easier for you. It, it can seem daunting a lot of the times, but 
you know, it, it's easier said than done, pretty much. You go in, you fill it all out, put as much information in as possible. You know, you can't put too much information in there. The more you put in, the more it helps certification bodies and the assessors like myself go through it. If you would like to do Cyber Essentials, you know, drop us a note, visit our website at isgovern.com. We can take you through the process. You know, we have options for you uh, you're doing the certifications. If you need support, we've got support options there. Or, you know, if you've got any questions, stick it in the comments below this video here and go from there. So I hope you like this video. If you do, you know, give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Um, feel free to subscribe to us to get more information about Cyber Essentials and all the other services that we're offering. We are looking at giving more information out, you know, free of charge, things like that, just making life easier for you. So, yeah, thanks very much.